Welcome to the Battery Testing Mentor Podcast. My name is Johannes and here I discuss all topics around battery testing and battery safety. Short, on the point and with practical advice. Also visit www.batterytestingmentor.com and sign up for the email update. With every episode I send out the short at the key takeaways straight into your inbox. And if you have any questions, comments, whatever, just hit reply on this email and you directly reach me. With that, I want to go directly into the fourth part of Benjamin's interview. It We, we continue the discussion about battery pack testing and about his experience. And I do not want to hold you up now. Let's go into the interview and I come back after the interview again. Maybe let's step back a moment and, and define once again what is product validation and what is serious validation. Product validation would be, I can only speak now from the perspective of my experience, the company where I worked, that can differ from company to company, from OEM to OEM. For us, product validation really meant, the product that was designed by research and development is released. So according to the requirements originally defined at the very beginning, it works. And it also works in the countries where it is to be sold. After all, you have to protect yourself as an OEM and minimize the risk, especially for the market where you want to launch it. The legal basis can also change and suddenly the country says, but that's not possible the way you did it, what you've done here, you still need this one or the other test. That is the product validation. And the series validation or also the startup validation of the series plant is that you pull products out of production at a certain interval and then do tests. At that time, we had distinguished between two different types of tests, a light test, where we just looked to see if the production line was still working properly. The battery was only subjected to less than 1% of its life cycle in the test, so that we were able to put it on the market afterwards, with appropriate labeling, of course, so we then sold the batteries after the test in vehicles. And then there was the more severe test, where we recreated everything, mechanics, heat, cold, does the electrical system work, and so on. And after all the tests the battery was opened up and examined. Because electrical tests are all well and good, but as long as you don't know what's going on inside, the measurement data is of no use to you. Your electrical result can look very nice, and then when you open the battery and all you find inside is a pile of something. What can you find inside there, inside the battery? <laughs> yes, I would say, you can find a lot in there. Thank God. I haven't found that much in batteries myself. I was lucky in this regard, really. In fact, I saw once a failed test during product validation, which was very, very annoying. But at least you can report back to research and development, hey, congratulations, you've designed a really good product. It was really like that, the battery went through all the tests and passed all of them, the battery passed the hardest tests, the shock test was passed, the vibration test was passed, all the water tests were passed, sand dust tests as well, also the electrical tests were passed. And then the last test was a diving test. I personally see this as the most critical of all the tests. And it happened that one of the employees of the laboratory had not plugged in the connector correctly, the high voltage connector. It didn't engage properly. And the battery is only sealed when the plug is inserted completely and locks. And then, when the battery was submerged, the water trickled through the plug, because it was not properly engaged. And thank God, we monitor the battery while it's being tested, while it's being submerged. The CAN communication is maintained and I saw how the insulation resistance of the battery sank down and then I saw how, according to the architecture, how the battery is built, from the bottom to the top, like how it is arranged in the electronic section of the battery, how it filled up with water and then shut down individually. So it was really the case, I was sitting there thinking to myself, oh, now I'm losing this signal. 
oh, and now I'm losing the voltage, oh, now I'm losing that signal, oh, now I'm losing the temperatures and at some point everything was gone, and at that moment I immediately yelled over, stop, pull up the battery immediately. And then we stored the entire battery in a safety container for a week and then checked and measured the safety. And then we transported it away and dismantled everything. And you could really see inside what the dear water from the river was doing. Everything inside was corroded and rotten. There was algae inside. And of course you used the fluorescent agent in the diving tests to see the leakage later and that was wonderful to see here. In the dark under black light, this then glows wherever water got into. But because the battery was modular, the cell compartment was separated from the electronics compartment and the water really only penetrated the electronics compartment. So nothing reached the cells. That was the luck and the misfortune. But it was still annoying. This test ran for several months and then really in the last step it failed and we had to start again. Yeah, they can throw everything away. And it is unfortunately not the case that you will be reimbursed by the testing institute, maybe for the one test, but you will still have to order and pay for the rest again. In the end, I mean, the testing costs are probably the lowest part, like if you talk about the battery cost, just to, to produce it again, uh, delays, uh, if it goes into still stand of production, I mean, then the testing costs are, are peanuts compared to what comes there. Yes, exactly. And in my first project, it actually turned out that exactly this product validation, that is, what we did abroad, an existing battery design on a new line. The product validation had to prove that this new battery factory delivers the same quality, produces the same requirements, that the product, the battery, meets the same requirements and has the same properties as it has in the parent factory. And it was good that we did this validation. Because it then turned out, basically through internal things, which I won't dive into here, the battery factory built up an, how to say it, an older production status. It didn't receive the changes and updates that were implemented in the parent plant. And so we built something where the tests showed afterwards that the cell block rubs against the housing under stronger mechanical stress, when exposed to vibration. And that is bad in many ways. Not only with regard to corrosion, but also with regard to a possible short circuit and so on. And we were very tight on time with the test execution. And so it was decided that 50 models would be built already, kind of as special luxury models. These were then blocked until the battery test results were there and the battery was released. But the battery was not released because we found exactly this error pattern. And accordingly, we had a loss, a comparably small loss compared to a large plant, but here we were in a very small plant. That was then in the end I think around 1.5 million euros to rebuild everything, you have to disassemble the vehicle to the step that you can remove the battery, then you had to replace the battery. And before that, you had to upgrade the factory to the new production status, and then reassemble everything, and in the meantime, it was basically already start of delivery. That means you were paying significant sums every day, because the line was down and the vehicles didn't get into the market. Mm. Yeah, sometimes there are these situations where you really notice it in the test lab, when the pressure rises and uh, in the end you get calls every hour about the status of the test. <laughs> yes, of course, of course. That is normal in these situations. <laughs> yeah, I felt it. <laughs> um, in, in this regard, like, just to make it clear, it is the case that for this uh, type of testing, the, the abuse testing is not so relevant. It's mainly focused on environmental tests, on performance tests, right? 
Yes, yes, it is done. They are performed by, how should we call it, the parent plant or by the headquarters, every OEM, be it a European, an American or an Asian one, does it the same way. They have their research and development in their home country, perhaps they also have a development site in another country. And then nothing is actually done locally in the market where the battery or the electric vehicle is sold. It is rare when research and development is done again abroad or further tests are carried out. Normally you say that development is done centrally in my home country and then the product is released for the whole world. And everything beyond is not important. Unless there are legal changes. And those are regularly coming, of course. Before, what I wanted to ask is, like, when you take it out of the series production, you do this validation, there the focus is on performance and environmental testing. Exactly, performance testing, environmental testing and electrical testing. And safety is only tested, this word, only, is maybe a bit misleading, it is tested, that the systems inside the battery work. So, that the sensors measure accurately and electrical fault cases are simulated. For example, a voltage is interrupted, or another example, you connect resistors that represent an insulation fault. And the system has to detect that and recognize it and then react accordingly. These kind of things are checked. What is not checked is that such a thick nail is driven through the battery. In this case, the design should have already been properly developed and tested. So here in this product validation, the focus is really on how does the battery behave in the long term, in the long run, when it is used normally and not when it is, I don't know, exposed to accidents, crashes and so on. Yes, accidents are simulated, but only at the electrical level the accidents are simulated. There are scenarios that the battery management system must recognize as accidents. And it has to react accordingly and set signals, block, open and lock the contactors, and things like that. It has to show it can do that. We have a so-called crash test. The signals to the battery management system are simulated, so that it thinks it has been involved in a vehicle accident. And then the BMS has to write into the memory that the corresponding component is losing life and lifetime. So it's not just that the vehicle is telling the driver, please go to service. In addition, the contactors are then tagged, you have experienced an accident, so you now have a lower lifetime. Please replace the contactors of this battery earlier. Yeah, that goes really into complexity of the components. Um, it reminds me a bit of this thing you said before about over-engineering. Yes, not everyone does that. In a way, it's over-engineering. But it also has its purpose. If another manufacturer doesn't do it and brings the vehicle on the road, then of course he has a certain advantage. But then we should see in five or ten years if one manufacturer has saved money at the wrong thing and uh, or on the other hand if one of these other German manufacturers or, or other high quality manufacturers have over engineered um, in the wrong spot. Indeed, indeed. We will see this then at one point in time. Okay. Do you have anything else that you want to share or that you, you want to tell to the listeners um, anything on your mind? No, spontaneously I can't think of anything. It has been a lot of fun. Yeah, I enjoyed it as well. I found it super interesting. Uh, I think I will come back to you. I will now process all your input in my brain and then come with many, many questions. Sure, please let me know. Maybe there is also some feedback from the listeners coming, maybe they say what was interesting to them and what wasn't. Or maybe they let me know, that was wrong. 
Yeah, so far we didn't have the emails of that was wrong. <laughs> Um, but dear listeners, uh, you see, Benjamin is really happy to, to get your emails and I promise you, he will take care of every of your emails personally. For sure. But then thank you very much for your time, for all your insights. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. And I'm looking forward to seeing you here again. So this was the last part of the interview. We have now listened to Benjamin for like in, in four parts. He shared a lot of his experience from battery cell testing, the early testing, the early development to the battery pack testing now. In this episode, we talked about the, the whole area of the validation testing, how to assess batteries, especially the how important it is to look into the battery after a test, what happens when a test fails and how this whole costing issue is, is really at the core uh, of, of the problem when our test really does not pass. And we finish with kind of the tests that are in such a production series validation. I found it very interesting. Now, I would like really to hear from you if you found this interview interesting, if you want to hear more like this, more interviews with different people, if you want to listen to other topics as well, um, just please share with me your thoughts, your ideas. I am really curious and would be really happy if I hear from you. With that, I thank you for this week's time and next week we will see each other again, probably with an um, episode just with me where I talk about a topic again. Let's uh, see what comes out. With that, thank you very much and hear you next week here at the Battery Testing Mentor Podcast.